Well, hello. It's time for another exciting episode of Pens in Use. This is the show where I talk about the pens and inks I've been using throughout the week. If videos like this interest you, where I talk about fountain pens and inks, both new and old, and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And I've got a lot of diverse topics tonight, so uh, stay tuned and please feel free to comment on any of them down below. So let's dive into the pens. So from left to right, I have a Stipula Etruria Prisma 88 Magma. Pilot Custom Heritage 92, Hero H718, I feel like I need to go whoop with the labels, <laughs> Platinum President, Aurora 88, Visconti Homo Sapiens, Geha 722, Kaveco V14S, Micaiah Decapod Twist, and a Lamy 2000. As always, I'll be recording the writing samples in my Bommel Art Journal. Uh, so my first pen is the Stipula Etruria Prisma 88, uh, the Magma finish. I've had my ups and downs with this pen. This is a really bad first impression. I've replaced the feet in it and uh, done some other stuff with the nib and I've improved it a bit. Uh, part of me just thinks, you know, somehow I just need to learn to get along with it. So anyway, this pen And of course the nib is a T-Flex. And the ink in it is Roar, Roar and Klingner Helianthus. Sunflower. And that writing there is glorious and wet and wonderful. And I absolutely adore this color. And yet at times this pen can run remarkably dry and I haven't quite figured out the rules behind how it does that. I recently had the idea that I'd be filming a video where I replaced this with an ebonite feed but the ebonite feed I had in mind didn't fit so that video will not happen. My next pen has one of my favorite inks in it this is a Pilot Custom Heritage 92, which has one of the best pistons of any of my pens. And the ink looks like paint inside of it. I hope I kept an appropriately worshipful silence during all that. I just uh, really love this ink. And uh, I don't know, this pen is like the perfect expression of this ink. It's just beautiful. My next pen I haven't used in a long time. It's a very heavy pen, Chinese. It's a hero. H718 Oh whoops, where's the nib? Okay, this isn't a safety pen, but it 
you know, has those roots. Uh, the ink in it is stipula musk green. I think there were too many tails in the musk there. This is one of those really nice murky green inks that at first you're just like, ugh, that's a swamp killer. And then the more you look at it, the more you're like, yeah, give me some of that. Just a very fun ink. My next pen is a Platinum President. I had this one inked last week. Uh, this has a broad cursive italic nib. Ground by Dan Smith of the Nib Smith. I just love the feel of this nib. Uh, my next purchase goal with this nib is to get a uh, double broad with this same grind. Uh, the ink in it has a name that doesn't match this color. It is Sumi Color Green. I don't really see much that's green about this ink, but whatever. It's a special edition ink in a very pretty bottle, and uh, you know, somebody mentioned in the comments I should show the bottles of all these inks, but uh, I don't know, it's just too much clutter for this. If you saw this, the set outside this Hollywood uh, version of it, you'd be like, what? <laughs> so uh, probably better if I don't. My next pen is an Aurora 88. Uh, this is supposed to go to Aurora for a little repair session to deal with that. But with the current uh, virus excitement, I decided to wait on that. So, since it's here still, I decided to ink it up again because I do enjoy writing with it. It has a flex nib. Hardly, you know, a true flex nib, but it is kind of fun. Uh, the ink in it is Robert Oster Jade. And then I get to my next pen, which uh, last week I was trying to show you the sheen. Uh, that stuff's not dry yet. I didn't do the best job, but it's right there in the dark parts. So it has a very reddish sheen. So of course I'm using my Visconti Homo Sapiens, and it's Diamine November Rain. A uh, fun thing about this pen, a lot of people have complained about the quality of Visconti. I've only ever owned two of them. This is one of them, and uh, I forget the model of my other, but anyway, I've had very good luck with this model. You know, when you take into account my very limited experience. Uh, this ink is supposed to be heavily sheening ink. I recently wrote a pen pal letter with this ink in it. And, uh, 
yeah, it shows up much better on Tomoe River paper than it does on Bomo Art Journal paper. Imagine that. Uh, this pen is still full of, well, not full of ink, but still has a lot of ink in it. A Geha 722. I'll be honest, that color is the main reason why it's been hard to use it up. It has an oblique broad nib on it. The ink, of course, is Deatrementis. Apple Blossom. And it's just, you know, very nice pink color. But not one really associated with uh, strength. Or ambition. But it does smell good. Which brings me to a pen that will probably be here for a few more weeks yet because it's so stingy with the ink. Caveco V14S. Oops. It has a fine nib on it. And the ink in it is Pilot Blue Black. Until recently, I had another pen that had um, Parker Quink Blue Black in it, but that pen has run empty. And I filled that pen a week or so after I filled this one, so... You know how I said this one just seems to last forever? I'm not joking! And this is a very nice shade of Blue Black. I skipped last week because I felt like I had enough pens, but this week I don't feel like I have enough pens. I have my Nakaya Decapod Twist. Uh, this is almost always inked up and almost always with this ink, but I've promised myself when I run out of this ink, I'm going to put a different ink in it. And the way it's skipping there, I'm wondering if that's me or if it, oh yeah, it's close. <laughs> it is close to empty. Okay, so don't expect this ink in it next week. Of course, now it's going to perform perfectly. Okay, yeah, I told you that pen was almost empty, and we just ran out. I probably shouldn't have even included it in tonight's video. But yeah, she's empty. I just wanted to mention, most of my pens I just keep in my pen case together. This one, I keep in its pen kimono. And of course, this pen kimono came with the pen. Uh, but I have four or five different Chinese pen kimonos. So I'm just kind of curious, as one of the questions for the end of the video, for the comments might be, is there a pen you keep in a pen kimono? I'm sorry I couldn't finish that, but she's out of ink, so what, what, what am I supposed to do? Fill it again? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Alright, my last pen is my trusty daily writer, which I refill over and over again without cleaning it out. This is a Lamy 2000. Uh, this particular one is a fine, and the ink in it is Petty Con 4001 Brilliant Black. And I recently had a question about the difference between Petty Con 4001 Brilliant Black and Petty Con uh, Edelstein Onyx. So I will try to figure out a way to answer that next week.
All right, so those are the pens and inks that I've been using throughout the week. Uh, like I said, the Nakaya was just about empty, and uh, I ran it dry right in front of you. So, sad day. But I'm kind of excited to try a different ink in it. So if you do have a suggestion for an ink to try in a soft, fine nib, let me know down in the comments. But that's not the main theme of tonight. Um, just looking over here. Uh, one of my big things I've been doing this week... I've done a lot of cleaning through this winter. If you don't know me, uh, you don't know this, but I did a huge cleaning project in my classroom. Um, more recently, I started cleaning out this living room. I made a joke on Facebook a few months ago about, well, actually it wasn't a joke, it was a true story. Um, I, I had everything torn apart and I had you know, stuff in piles everywhere to be sorted for throw away, keep, put somewhere else, give away and all that. And uh, got a knock at my door, and these two little kids were there. And uh, they're, you know, from my neighbor, from right over there. And uh, the one says, this house is really messy. I'm just like, oh, of course you would come right now. Um, so I've been doing a lot of cleaning, but you know, with my enforced time home, I've had a lot of time to look at my bookshelves and just think, am I really ever going to reread that book? And look at a lot of other things in the living room and think, you know, am I ever going to finish that project? And I've been getting rid of a lot of stuff. You may have noticed some, you know, incremental changes to that shelf back there. That's just one symptom of it. Right now, I've got four or five things laying around that are still waiting for a permanent home. But basically, I've done it. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'll probably finish up the living room. Uh, then I'll go do the bedroom, but that'll be a quick one. And the kitchen, that'll be quick. Um, and then I'll start doing the, working on the basement, which will be a lot, it'll be a lot longer term project, because there's a lot more that's been let go there. But, anyway, the moral of the story is, I've done a lot of decluttering. How about you? If you've been stuck at home, have you been using this time to clean your house, to, uh, reorient your life for when things get better let us know down in the comments um another thing i've been doing a lot of is cooking i i have always been one to do a lot of homemade cooking i uh most of the meals i eat during the week are homemade but uh i've been doing a lot more like making my own bread and you know, which which is something that's usually just kind of a luxury if I have free time. Because uh, I don't get any free mornings in the week to finish bread. Um, I, I've been doing, uh, made my own tortillas, which is a recipe I have, but I rarely have time to complete them. Uh, just a lot of things like that. So, that's kind of exciting. Um, one other, a lot more reading. You can tell, back there, I read. <laughs> I have a lot of books. Uh, right here in this living room, there are four bookshelves. Go to my bedroom, there are three more. I am a heavy reader. But one thing that's been coming to me lately is... Just a second, let me get up and get it. I... Uh... I tried to do a video series where I uh, got into this, but I, I didn't really do what I wanted to do with it. But uh, this is a Kindle. Now, I'm not so much a fan of giving Amazon all my money, because Amazon, in my opinion, is way too big. Uh, if I buy books, I prefer to buy them from Barnes & Noble or, you know, a local retailer, but... Kindle is one of those things that really keeps me coming back to Amazon. And I don't know how many books are on here. There's a lot. But this is how much space they take up. Now, uh, last night I reread a book. I talked about it a few years ago on a, one of my driving videos um, called Prairie Schools by Lois Lenski. And uh, the book is bigger than my Kindle. Check it. So,
So, <laughs> I'm kind of curious, where are you at with electronic books? I don't really like reading books on my uh, iPad. Of course, it's an iPad 3. It's, you know, the third edition that came out, so it's old. Uh, but, you know, in general, I, I, I like reading them on my Kindle, but not on my iPad. I don't mind my iPad for things like graphic novels, like The Walking Dead or whatever that stuff is. Uh, but... And, and actually, The Economist isn't bad on my iPad, but overall, I prefer a real book. But in general, do you prefer real books or electronic? If you like real books, how do you deal with things like this, these growing collections of books? Now, yes, the library is a beautiful thing, and you can get a lot of books in the library, and then you don't have to buy them. And that's one of those things I really need to work on. I used to be really good at it. And then I, well, then I moved to a town of 1,500 people with a very limited library. So there is that. But anyway, um, there is something about paper that's I like. I especially enjoy paper if I reference something. Now... I'm not going to reference much from this book. But I might reference something like from... Just grab a book here that looks like a likely one. This. Getting Things Done by David Allen. It's a lot easier to reference stuff if it's in paper. And you can put a little post-it on certain pages or whatever. So I'm just curious where you are. Uh, I can't help but picture this living room if it was all on Kindle. This living room, the bedroom, if it was all electronic, how much more space I would have, how much less visual clutter. And uh, I'll just tell you a secret. My favorite thing about staying in a motel room is how uncluttered they are. Yeah, my ideal house, I love books, but that clutter bothers me. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of in a weird place with that because I love books, and I always think it's really sad when I go to somebody's house and there's no books, no bookshelves. And you just think, ugh! Especially if they have kids, you're just like, oh my god, they're missing out on human experience. How realistic is that? I don't know. Um, I do have my biases. But I think there's something to that. So, uh, this Sunday, I'm going to do a driving video. I will talk about this book. So, consider it a book review. I uh, won't be driving through the area where it is. But what stuns me as a 44-year-old man, this is a book I first read when I was six years old. Six or seven, I guess I don't know exactly. It talks about towns like Selfridge, Hedinger, Mowbridge. Those are all towns I know. They talk about a town called Oak Leaf. No such town existed. But the book is actually based on a town called Maple Leaf, which does exist, or did exist, I, I should say. Uh, according to Google Maps, there's a few foundations there. And they never name it, but it also talks about a town called McLaughlin. I've been to McLaughlin lots of times. I love McLaughlin. So, yeah. Um, I read this first when I had my tonsils out as a first grader in, in school. And uh, it just seems funny that I ended up so close to where this book took place. I don't know, I've always had a fascination with the prairie, and I think this book is why. <laughs> so, I suppose I could say one of the questions in the comments would be, uh, is there a book that really influenced you?
and influences you to this day? Let us know in the comments. Books are powerful. Now, the other thing I have, uh, I wrote here was uh, possible Wasky Squirrel origin <laughs> stories. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I grew up in a, well, started life near a town called uh, Shingle House. I actually was closer to a much smaller town called Honeyoy, but it was like a suburb of Shingle House, uh, if such a thing makes sense in such a rural area. But we lived out on a gravel road. Uh, we, we had five acres of land, and we were, uh, our, the north border of our land was the New York and Pennsylvania state lines. So our driveway came out right on the state line. It was kind of an interesting uh, place to grow up, but uh, we, we lived on an unpaved road. And uh, I do have memories of the place. But we moved away when I was in around four years old. We moved to a town called Halifax. And uh, Halifax was a little bigger. Uh, the big thing with Halifax is it had a lot of housing developments around it. So the town of Halifax wasn't that big. But because of the whole suburbs around it, metropolitan area, whatever you want to call it, it was a lot bigger. Um, we lived on Highway 147. And my mother says that for the first few weeks we were there, my brother and I would just stand in the window at the house and watch all the trucks going by because, yeah, we, we'd lived our first years on a gravel road. This is a whole new world for us. Um, it was there that I went to elementary school and when I had my tonsils out in first grade, uh, one of the neighbors, who was a retired teacher, gave me this to read. Uh, fast forward a few years. In After 8th grade, we moved again to a town called Cowdersport, which is where I graduated high school. Uh, we moved out into the country again. We lived on a gravel road. In fact, my parents still lived there. And uh, there we were. But by then I had learned to appreciate some of the value of living in town. Now, yes, there is value in living out of town. Uh one of the things I miss still to this day is the peace and quiet. And the other thing I really miss to this day is the darkness. And I suppose the privacy, but we didn't have as much privacy as it felt like we had. Because, you know, I, you know, to do an extreme example, I never would have pranced naked through the yard. Because who knows when one of the neighbors is out wandering through the woods. <laughs> So, uh, you know, but anyway, my parents still live out there. I don't know how much longer. They're, they're older. My uh, 70s and 80s are their, is their range of their ages. I don't want to be too specific because sometimes that gets used for identification or password hacking. But, uh, yeah, they, for now they still live out there. Uh, but I, I just can't help but wonder... Um, Well, what would it have been like if I'd lived in the 1940s or 1950s in uh, North Dakota, which was, well, this book takes place in South Dakota, but which was very behind the times. I don't know. Um, it, it, I find it interesting at the... Okay, this uh, makes me a little sad, but, you know, I think about my own students. Um at the end of this novel, the teacher, because it's a one-room schoolhouse in this Maple Leaf, well, they call it Oak Leaf, but whatever, uh, this Maple Leaf, South Dakota. And the teacher mentions to this girl that, you know, there is life beyond this. Are you really going to let yourself be limited by this? And, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll have an outline on uh, Sunday when I do my driving video. I won't be driving past Maple Leaf, but I'll put a link in the video description to this video uh, where I did drive past Maple Leaf. But, uh, 
yeah, I, I just feel there's a lot in this book to talk about. Like they, they make a joke about minstrel shows. Um, if you don't know what a minstrel show is, that's where they used to do the black face. Where they'd actually color their faces black. Um, and yes, for the all the worst reasons you can think of. Um, the and, and in this book they have a coal furnace blow up on some kids and they get covered with coal dust and... You know, they're told, oh, you're trying to start a minstrel show. And uh, back then, it would have been a lot more acceptable. Now, what I find inter interesting about Lois Linsky, Lensky, sorry, is she, from her writing, you can tell she is aware of racism. She is a product of her time, of course, but she is well aware of it. So, definitely a topic to explore in my video on Sunday. Um, I don't know if I have too much more to add. I'm just looking over. I don't know what I'm really looking at. <laughs> looking at my whatever. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I've wondered if this novel is what got me into North Dakota. I mean, what put that idea into my head in the first place? And uh, it's pretty much coincidence that I ended up close to where this novel takes place. But the getting out to this area, Lois Lenski, you have a lot to answer for. <laughs> so, um, I don't have too much more to add. I... Uh, I got this closer to being on time this week. This whole COVID-19 thing where I'm teaching online has been a bugger for me. And it's still getting to me. I, uh, I, I don't know. I just spend my whole day on a computer or near a computer or not too far away from a computer. And to, then to sit down and film a video just kind of... Uh. So what I'm going to do tomorrow and the next day, and the next day, because I have, well, today, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday off, I'm going to film a whole bunch of uh, pen videos and uh, try and get ahead on that. Or, alternatively, I may film a whole bunch of classroom videos <laughs> and try to get ahead on that. But either way, I'm going to get ahead on one set of my videos so that I don't feel so overwhelmed by videos, so when my teaching's done, I don't just go, Oh, God, i got to do a pen video. I don't want that attitude about this, because this is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be my release. And uh, I have just haven't been feeling that these past few weeks. And it may have something to do with just the whole depression over the virus. Um, in other news, this week on Wednesday, instead of my normal pen video... I was going to, yeah, I actually had a video in mind, but then I decided to share a video about a mask. And I got some comments that I think really misinterpreted what the mask was all about. Uh, the mask I was printing is not designed for personal protection. If I want personal protection, I'm going to wear, you know, the full body suit. I'm going to have the sealed mask around my face, the respirators and so on. Um. Kind of like you'll see it in the hospital. But, what the mask I was printing was, it's actually meant to protect the people around you. You know, if I have the virus and I'm breathing it out and I just don't know it, supposedly it's going to catch it. I mean, maybe it's not as good as uh, the full body suit or whatever, but... It's supposed to do pretty well. Those those masks that people wear protect everybody else. So that's what the mask was all about. And of course, the hospital has to, has to add a few things to it. They have to add the rubber part that goes around your face. Uh, they have to add the filter, because there was no filter in the part I printed. And uh, they have to add the elastic bands. And good luck to them. So I did a prototype. We'll see. I did a second one for me. Mainly I did it because I want a souvenir after this is all over. The other reason I did it is if we in North Dakota we are asked to all wear masks. I've got one. 
I'll have to steal some elastic bands from goggles or something, but at least I've got one. But I didn't want to leave anybody with the impression that those masks are about personal protection because they're not. They're about protecting others. The mask I was printing is something that would be worn in a ward of the hospital where not where the COVID-19 patients are, but where everybody else is and you're just trying to protect them, make sure they don't get COVID-19. So uh, that's what that was all about. And so I apologize. I uh, did that video without a script and uh, probably misled a lot of people. I, I could tell I misled a few from the comments. So I apologize. Uh, some of the comments that were blurred out by wind noise, as some of you pointed out. Um, we don't have a lot of openings in the school where I teach for next year. There's an elementary special ed and, el and an elementary classroom opening for next year, and that's about it. Uh, the neighboring school district, if you want a little bit smaller school, does have a science opening, and uh, so I'd encourage you to do that, especially uh, I would love to work with somebody who's as into science as I am. You know, we could do some cross-district collaboration and stuff and i would love that so if you are interested in the science job out in the middle of nowhere or you know one of the elementary jobs here uh let me know in the and i will hook you up so uh that's about all i have so if videos like this interest you where i talk about fountains pens both new and old and at all price points i would invite you to subscribe and uh if you have comments about electronic versus paper books or god i can't even think how many different topics i brought up tonight any of the other topics including an interest in a job let me know down in the comments or uh, you know email me at the channel email and i'll try to help you out so <laughs> i'll talk to you later bye bye